Over to you, Dr. Chuck. Thanks, Ian. <coughs> so you can see uh, that Ian edited my bio that was on this slide to the parts that were actually relevant. So uh, one of the things that, that, I've, that I've been doing in the last year or so is coming up with conference talks that aren't just for you. And the idea is I want to go to other conferences, and I want to, and I want to subtly, oh, it got messed up. They edited it. Um, I want to go to other conferences, and I want to subtly promote Aperio, Sakai, and all the work that we're doing here. And so this, this, if you look at this picture, and you'll see it, if you take my courses, just below there, it got cropped, is a Sakai logo from 2006. And I start, I end every online lecture with a picture of me that I took in 2006. Just like lots of people, you stop updating your picture after a while. You just kind of keep the, keep the old picture. It was a good picture. I took it when I was executive director of the Sakai Foundation. So if you're not listening, just try to count the number of times you see the Sakai logo in an otherwise talk that has nothing to do with Sakai. And if you take my Coursera course, count the number of minutes that you're watching a Sakai logo in a Coursera course. Just as seems as though I'm randomly choosing my clothing, but I'm not. And so the Sakai logo and Sugi logo and Aperio logo, they show up sort of like as little mascots throughout the course. So I'll start talking about the largest programming course in the world. So this uh, recent screenshot, I stopped calling it the largest Python course in the world and realized that it's just the largest programming course in the world. I have the honor, pleasure, and good fortune and just plain dumb luck to teach the largest Python course in the world. And the revenue from this largest Python course in the world that I get is pretty prodigious. And it's part of the reason I can sponsor this conference. Um, last month, I graduated 4,500 new programmers. Um, so every week, 1,000 new programmers come into the marketplace using the Python language. I uh, recently went from Coursera to edX, January, and I am uh, now adding about uh, 3,000 people per week on edX. Uh, part of what you'll see is I really want to show free and open education, even though Coursera and edX try to monetize this. Um, it still leads to a lot of free stuff. So one of the things I think people who are successful always forget to do, and that is acknowledge the the extent to which dumb luck played a role in their success. Um, I did not plan for this. I luckily worked at an institution that was one of the four, four founding uh, schools in Coursera. I was lucky enough to teach the, like the 30th course on Coursera in 2012. And, but up to that point, I had been spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to teach people to program, explicitly not teach people how to be computer scientists, right? And so I. Computer scientists conflate the idea of programming as, a, as a, the beginning of a computer science degree, a career, right? So if you're going to write a single line of code, then you have, in their mind, committed to being in a monastery writing code the rest of your life. And that's what you should be happy. And I, I said, like, that's crap. That's only appropriate for like 4% of the people in the world. I'm a computer scientist. And I love my computer science degree. but. That's only 4% of the people that need to know about technology. And so I had built this curriculum that was all about programming and zero about computer science. I, I wrote a book, and I took the word recursion out. Turns out in my textbook, if you look, you find the word recursion in the book exactly once. And it's in the preface where I say, you will never find the word recursion in this book anywhere, which is actually a really good lesson on recursion, right? So the other thing that I figured out early on, partly because I had a background in television and radio from the, from the late 90s, I built my own streaming courses. I built my own streaming software in like 95, 96, 97, and 98, is that it's about people. It's not just, wow, we record this stuff and stick it up there, and it stays dead. But these poor students are forced to watch this crap. And they, it's the only choice they have because whatever, because all the teachers are adjuncts or whatever. But if you could inject personality and love, et cetera. So in my courses, I have things like graduation ceremonies with graduation speakers that are only five minutes long because it's online. People don't have a long uh, 
long attention span. And so this is Kurt Bonk from Indiana. And I had told him in my office, set up three cameras, and I said, we're going to have a graduation ceremony. I put him in a little MP3 player. I played Pomp and Circumstance. We walked in. I made him give a five-minute a, a speech about students' futures and all this. And I did it just because I thought it'd be fun, but students have sent me an email that said it, they cried when they graduated, right? They are like, I'm from Iran. I'm never going to go to U.S. University. I'm never going to go to university in my country, and here I am sitting in my house watching on my phone, and you just handed me a diploma through my phone, and it made me cry. And that's people, right? That's not like, oh, thanks for the Python knowledge guy. Thanks for the good book. No, that's, if you can make people, it's Johnny Cash that said, if you can make people cry with that thing, then you know what you're doing. I also love to travel. I go meet my uh, teaching assistants. My teaching assistants have been running this course now for about the, I ran it for like the first two months, and they've been running it ever since. These are now uh, paid staff at the University of Michigan from all over the world. Uh, but they uh, love this course, they love the students, and when you come into my course, you get a teaching team that knows each other, that knows everything, that has been given all the data and knowledge to really teach the course very well. I also, uh, in my earliest online experience, uh, I, uh, my first online experience was using real audio in 1997, and I had a fully online course. Uh, in 1997, where people were dialing up with 14 form modems to be fully online. And uh, what frustrated me about that was I was trying to be funny, trying to be charming, and the students seemed to be enjoying the class, and they would talk about how fun it was. And I was getting very sad and depressed because I felt like I was absolutely not part of this online class that I had created that was making people happy, but I wasn't in it. I was. I was out of it. So this is the reason that I started this, this trek to all corners of the earth to meet my students. So I'll show up in Cape Town. Stephen Marquardt will pick us a, a, little, a little pub or something, and I'll send email to 750,000 people, say I'll be at this pub in Cape Town from, 10 to, uh, from 7 to 9 tonight, and I'll buy everybody beers. And they show up usually 10 to 12, and then I make a little video. And you can go and you can see these videos at drchuck.com slash office. This is a little out of date. I've done this 75 times now. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to finding more cities. I've not been to South America. One of these, they all think I'm going just to uh, meet them, but I really i am only going because I go to Open Aperio Africa, and then I meet my students. Um, but pretty soon I'm going to be like, damn it, I'm going to Egypt, right? Or I'm going to go to Venezuela because it, my, my map has just kind of got blanks in it. And so I might just jump in a plane and go talk to students and do nothing else. When I started with Coursera, the whole goal of Coursera was to educate the world for free. We, the University of Michigan, joined it out of a sense of uh, duty and sense of love. We did not join to make a ton of money. We are now making a ton of money. Coursera forced us to make a ton of money because they had to make a ton of money and there was profit sharing arrangements. And so uh, I am an open education, open source person. I'm also an open education or resource person with remixability and all this stuff. And so in the time that Coursera was moving to monetize the courses that I'd given them for free, um, I built a complete copy, which is Sugi and Koseyu, open source imperial projects, that allows me to host a MOOC completely outside on really inexpensive hardware. And I literally have about 4,000 students that, that take it from Dr. Chuck Online, the university of me, right? I am not only just producing a course that I give to my university, give to Coursera, I have the university of Dr. Chuck. And you can go to online.drchuck.com and you see the, the growing university of Dr. Chuck. The other thing that happens when you teach online, especially to people you know, far outside the United States, is you are actually the entire university, right? There is no uh, career counseling. There is no um, student services when students are having emotional problems. You have to be all of that, student placement. So one of my favorite things that I did is a video I re-recorded lately where I just turned the camera on and I tried to tell students what they should take as their next steps, how to get a job, how to meet people, having nothing to do with Python. It's kind of this, at the end of class two, I say, this is what you need to do if you want to go further. And here are all your choices, and I just talk about it. But, and it's, it's some of my favorite video that I did, because this, this is very recent. Lots of the videos are old, because it's over five years old now. But 
I really loved saying, look, I've talked to so many students now all over the world, and they've told me stories of how they got jobs. And I'm just going to tell you in this lecture all those stories so that you have a story yourself, a narrative, to find yourself a job wherever you're at. Now, I've taken the position as I go through this as a, I'm a publisher, right? And so my actual competition is not the University of Michigan. It is Pearson. And so I have been building free and open textbooks as fast as I can. Uh, what's one of the wonderful things when you have a free and open textbook is uh, people volunteer, volunteer to translate it for free. So both my Python 2 and Python 3 uh, textbooks have a number of uh, professional grade translations that are absolutely free. They're free online with ebooks, PDF, HTML, and uh, we have a whole build process that makes the book automatically, and then I put them up on Amazon. Um, uh, the, the English book sells enough money to, it's, it does pretty good, but the, the other ones don't make any money, but it's a, such a wonderful symbolic gesture to have a physical p Python book in Italian or um, Chinese or Korean. Um, because I own all this intellectual property, the university has no bearing in it whatsoever. I own the book, I own all my videos, I own all my PowerPoint. I actually give them a copy which they manipulate, and I don't own those copies, but I retain my own copies. I've signed arrangements. This is a publisher in India that publishes my, prints and publishes my textbook, because if you're in India and you want to buy a, a textbook uh, off Amazon, uh, you can buy it off Amazon Europe and ship it to Amazon India, but the shipping is, so the book is like $10, which is expensive once translated into Indian currency, but the shipping is probably like $30 translated into Indian currency, so that's what the point. So there's a little company, Shroff Publishers, and they contact uh, like O'Reilly and everybody, and they just get the rights to reprint it. And so there are things like, um, like check, there it is, check COD availability for your PIN code. So there are, there are economies of how purchases are done and how things are delivered in India that are completely different than the rest of the world, right? They don't have Amazon Prime, but they have something that does something with your cell phone that you do a thing that somehow money happens, and then a book shows up two days later at your house. And so we embed this into the Indian economy. It's printed in India. It creates jobs in India. The costs are the Indian costs. The book is cheap. I think it ends up being about 3 or $4 in India, and then cheap shipping. And that's just because I own the damn book, and I just handed it to them. And they said, well, we'll give you some money. And now twice a year I get some money from India. I don't even need it. I just get money. It's really nice. That's <clears throat> why I have a car. Got to spend money somehow. So in this, I have a complete supporting website. I probably have around 50 to 100 classes around the country that teach my material using LTI, plugging into whatever LMS they've got. They get a key from me. They use my materials. They use my auto graders. They use everything. So I'm like the Pearson My Math Lab for Python, right? You just buy my $9 book or take it for free anywhere on the planet, and you can literally plug learning resources into your learning management system using learning tools, interoperability, using common cartridge, using all those things that, like in like, like the last 15 years that I developed, therefore I kind of know all these things. This is my auto grader. Turns out this was a frickin' work of genius, but I was just being lazy. This is a Python compiler that runs in the JavaScript browser that compiles Python to JavaScript and then runs the resulting JavaScript in a browser. So you can take my class on a phone. I, when my teaching assistants five years ago said, you need to make it so people can take this on a phone. I'm like, bah humbug, they got it installed on their laptop. Oh, come on, what are, what are we thinking? Nope, now thousands and thousands and thousands of people take their first two Python classes on a phone. I backed into it. I mean, I just did it because I didn't want to build a safe server-based environment to run their damn code, right? Because that would be hard. So I, just, I found this thing and, and, and used it in the browser. But then I turned it into AutoGrader. I added LTI to it. It's like, holy crap. I, I, I just dumb luck over and over and over again. Uh, I put my slides up on Google Slides, and it, they just random people contact me, and I give them all right permission to the whole damn thing, and they just translate, and no one's done anything bad. Probably about 250 people are like my slide translation army. Um, a thing I've done recently, so some of you might be concerned about Coursera and edX and their turn towards making more money and the, the potential that, that Coursera might even go private and the fear that that joins. So one of the things is I just 
publish, flood publish the whole damn world with this stuff in case something goes wrong. So this is a thing called Free Code Camp. Has anyone heard of Free Code Camp? Probably not. Okay, okay. Free Code Camp is damn cool. It is a Patreon-supported five-person company that does nothing but puts up uh, free videos and little tiny assessments on all kinds of things tech. And what has happened is they've done such a good job that people like me say, can I join your Free Code Camp? And the thing that they do that's really cool in addition to just putting up videos and assessments is they, in, they try to uh, create and encourage meetups in each of the geographic locations. And so, so this is like the perfect thing, right? And it's one billion percent free. And it's going to always be free because it's a lifestyle business for five people supported by about $40,005 per month Patreon. Or maybe it's somewhere between one and five. But they have just enough money to keep five people employed. And that's it. And Patreon is their entire source of revenue. If their Patreon goes down, they go to four people. If their Patreon goes up, they go to six people. This has the potential to change the world, really, because it's truly free. They got our values of free forever, right? Their, their fundraising is a healthy fundraising. It's completely voluntarily, voluntary. And I'm seeing, I'm following these folks now and retweeting them, and I'm just seeing people who are like big in other spheres finding their way to free code camp. Now, one of the things that Free Code Camp does that's really insane is they actually do the opposite of what most people think in terms of online videos. I gave them all of my videos on a giant hard drive. They concatenated them together end to end and created a single 13-hour YouTube video. Everyone says it should be five minutes. They say 13 hours. Let me tell you what happens. That means to watch any part of my lectures, you have to go to this video which means the view count goes up scorchingly high, super fast, and YouTube thinks this is a good idea, right? If I have 75 videos, all five minutes long, they're all counts are like 3,000, 3,500, but this is everything. Who'd have known? Who'd have thought? They found this out. It's really cool. You can also watch my class on Amazon binge watching, right along with Game of Thrones and all those other things. Um, so I'm on Amazon. Uh, this, I have a friend, and she works at Amazon, and she said, we're curious about Amazon Prime being for education. I'm like, okay, I'll put my stuff up there. I make 20 bucks a month on that. Uh, contacted, this is, by, uh, this, is, this is Korea. Somebody says, I'd like to translate your stuff into Korean. I'm like, yep, here you go, take it. How much does it cost? Nothing. Like, what am I going to do in Korea, right? When am I going to show up and sell this stuff in Korea? I'm not. So they just translate it. Coming up in China, the problem in China, even for Coursera, is that uh, the Great Firewall doesn't like YouTube, and Coursera doesn't even do all that great. So this, this, I just gave this dude 10 gigabytes of stuff, and they're, he's going to download it and put it all up in the Chinese YouTube, which is or whatever it is. But again, I, it's all mine, it's all free, and I just don't care. How am I going to get to China and sell this, right? Here's the thing I'm going to do in the next couple of weeks that's really cool. I've, 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 uh, I've got 40 liberal arts schools. Um, how many people went to liberal arts for their, their degree, right? How many, people still, how many people think liberal arts is a good idea and shouldn't die? Yeah, so I agree. I'm a computer scientist, but, I, but I'm really just a liberal arts guy. I just happen not to end up starting out at liberal arts. So I've been contacted by the presidents of about 40 liberal arts universities and they want to add technology as a core part of a curriculum, not as a computer science ma major, but instead core curriculum. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm creating a whole curriculum that's uh, very gentle and easy to adopt and easy for teachers who are already liberal arts teachers. So the goal of this is not to say, hey, liberal arts sucks. Get some computer scientists. Get rid of those stupid historians. They're a waste of time anyways. Who wants to know history anyways? What good's history? You know. React wasn't made by the Romans. I mean, who cares about the Romans, right? No, but my theory is, is that all that stuff is super valuable, and if I can take a history teacher and give that history teacher just enough knowledge to teach Python, it's way better for a history teacher to teach Python than it is to hire a computer scientist who totally ruins the culture of liberal arts. This is my curriculum that I'm working on for them. These are blind students that I met in India. I went to India, as I'll talk about in a second, and it was a like just like when the Beatles went to India, it's a religious experience. You don't, I don't think anyone can go to India and not come back. Uh, changed meeting these blind students has taught me a lot about accessibility. 
And, and, and frankly, it's taught me some about accessibility that the laws don't really capture correctly, and that is uh, what's really and truly important about accessibility. Um, I don't have time to fully talk about that, but it's completely changed my approach to building course materials. So let's talk about Python. What's the fuss about Python? Okay, what happened there? So if you're interested, I wrote a Quora article that got a whole bunch of likes that asked the question, like, what's the next big ab thing about Python? And I, I basically said, Python is going to destroy every single programming language on the planet, end of story. Here's a picture that I cite in that that basically is, if you look at the last 10 years, look at when Coursera was founded, look at when I started teaching Python, and I don't claim to be the driver of this. I'm just the beneficiary of this graph. Again, I, I picked teaching Python when Python wasn't cool, right? If you look at all these other major programming languages, what you see is that Python is going up and the other ones are flat or going down. So there's two, two th effects I think are going on here. All the new programmers on the planet are Python and uh, people are converting from, uh, from, Py from other languages to Python. When I went to India, the, the big question they asked, so they like, in India, they, they don't call you a teacher, they call you a guru. And I, for, you know, in my culture, when you're a guru, you're like something, it's like you're really special, you live on a top of a mountain and stuff. And so they didn't want me to talk about all the stuff I did that I just told you. They, they wanted me to explain the sort of the religious truth about Python, and that was part of my religious sort of awakening, was I had to wonder, right, because they said, don't just tell them about all your classes and all your students, they don't care about that. They want to like think of you as like the priest of Python. So, so I had to think and I had to understand why Python is such a movement, right? So the first thing is, is the core of Python is really tiny. If, I mean, literally I can teach, I can teach any human on the planet Python in about 10 weeks. And you've learned dictionaries, you've learned lists, you've learned files, you've learned strings, you learn variables, you learn loops, and that's it. And if you think of what it takes to learn loops in Java versus lo learn loops, and all that stuff is so small, the core of the language is so tiny. And the key thing that Python does that other languages don't do is they don't extend the language to achieve new things and invade new spaces. They simply build libraries. And so you can spend your whole career a 25-year-old Indian person who just got a degree can literally work for Accenture their whole career and switch from web design to data mining to online applications, almost to mobile applications, and literally artificial intelligence, natural language. You can literally change any, do any of those things and never learn another string variable, right? You're working with the same string variable that you learned when you were 16 years old and now you're 35 and 45 years old and you're looking at string variables. So if you start thinking about the es essence of, of Python, it's just so simple, right? And, and one of the things that you, if you've ever tried to write a C extension for Java, it is virtually impossible. It is like the hardest computer science you'll ever do. And that's because the types are so complex and then not only the types are so complex and you have a bunch of like pr methods that you've got to implement, but the types of the things coming in and out of the methods themselves are complex. Now this is why we love Java because you, it helps you not make mistakes, but it also means that it's really hard to write C code and plug it into Java. And so the, the primitives, if you compare Java, JavaScript, and Python, um, and PHP, you just find that the primitives in PHP are so beautifully consistent and so simple, and, and they get what you need done done, and you can extend it in other languages. Another thing that I think is interesting about Python is Python spent a decade going from Python 2 to Python 3. And I think that same decade that was Python was transitioning from Python 2, and in a sense, fighting with itself. I mean, the fight is over now. Python 2 is going to be deprecated like January 1, 2020, I think. But, um, vast majority of the energy in the Python world was dedicated to fighting amongst Python people as to whether or not we should keep going Python 2 because I don't want to port my code. That's, that energy is now available for everything else. So what you're going to see is you're going to see Python, all the brilliant people in Python have stopped beating each other up and are moving together now as one to do cool stuff. And all the libraries are there. Everything that's necessary has been moved to Python 3. There won't be a Python 4. 
I mean, it, it took 15 years to design and transition from Python 2 to Python 3. But it is perhaps one of the most amazing transition of a top 10 language in the world from a major non upwards compatible release where during the time, during the transition, the, uh, the inertia just increased, the speed velocity increased. So part of this has to do for me with what life looks like for a person graduating with a computer science degree in 2015. And I'll compare it to a person starting a computer science degree in, 2000, in 1975, that'd be me. So these are just the languages that I learned, APL, Fortran, CDC. Sometimes it was because I was teaching something new, sometimes it was because of a new job. At times it was because uh, I was learning about web programming, et cetera, et cetera. And so these are all my jobs and all those things. Now in this, I've got languages, and then I've got kind of variations of languages indented and in italic, right? So, you know, I learned Spring and I remember you can kind of see the Sakai phase of my life starting here, and then I went back to teaching, and then this is my teaching phase of my life. But here's the thing. Someone, this, this, the world was trying to figure a bunch of things out. Part, part of my problem was I'd go from one operating system to another in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, right? You can kind of see where I found myself in, in Linux and Unix at some point. I was on IBM mainframe for a while, Rex. I don't know how many people here know what Rex is. And I was learning Seashell. So, you, I mean, for the first part, Unix wasn't even a thing, right? But then later, Unix was a thing. But today, if you're starting, you're going to learn some things like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Python, SQL. And then you're going to spend a lot of your career learning libraries of those things, which is not the same as learning a whole new programming language. Because your string function calls don't change. You still have dictionaries. You still have arrays. You still have these primitives that are the language, right? We're not talking about capabilities. We're talking about the language. And, and then so this poor person, you know, it, life would be good at this point, but then they got stuck in some mobile company. And now they had to learn some stupid mobile code that's like, this isn't real Java. This is like Android Java. And then VB.net. And then they like, you know, I hate that. And so I'm going to learn Iconic. And then I learned all this stuff. And so this is later in their career. And then they finally actually have to learn some C because they got to do something super fast and super performant. You know, but what's the key thing is for, for these folks, it's all about libraries. It's not about languages, right? And here these were, I was, if at some point I saw variants like Turbo Pascal, but they don't see that. The future won't see that. They'll see libraries. When new capabilities are needed, people will build a Python library for that new capability, not invent a language, right? The operating system is set. The languages for all intents and purposes are set. It's about libraries going forward in the future. So this is just a, a, a summary. And I found this wonderful Wikipedia page, at least wonderful to me, of all the ways that you can do string functions in all the libraries for the past one million years, including like if you're using like, you know, rocks and breaking rocks to do string searches. And so this is just like a, uh, you know, APL, Pascal, C, uh, JavaScript, ASP, Right? I put this up because this is the crappiest part of my life, being on an airplane, trying to figure out if string x is inside of string y and where it is and what the frickin' return value is when I don't find it. Is it negative 1? Is it null? Is there a try and accept? In the future, new programmers will only have two ways to look for strings within other strings. There's the beautiful and elegant, and then there's the nasty imitation of Java that is JavaScript, right? And I'm just telling you, this wastes a ton of my time. The more languages you have in your head, the more time you waste trying to figure out whether the word world is inside of hello world or not. This is a great uh, website. I don't even know how much time I got left. How much time do I got? 9.15 or 9.30? Got 22 minutes, OK. So uh, we get bored. Take a look at this. This is TOB, and it's it's great view of like the most popular programming languages, and this is sort of like the current ones. And the key thing is is there's a ton of them, but the thing I'd call your attention to if you take a look at this is the languages that are going down, and in a sense why the languages that are going down are going down. So we got Ruby going down, we got PHP going down, we got Ruby go down. If you look down a little further, you see R going down. Now, I would basically say that the reason Ruby is going down, 
It's probably because Ruby sucks, and that's why it's got two downs. But Ruby's going down. But the, what is the thing that's taking over from Ruby? What is the thing that's like ripping Ruby off? We're taking the Ruby programmers and say, come to me, come to me. Well, it's Python. But then down here is R sinking fast, too. Where are the R people going? Come to Python. Come to Python, right? Where are the PHP people going? Come to Python. Come to Python, right? So what you often saw was you saw fights between things like, you know, Objective-C and C++, right? Okay, rah, rah, rah. Well, you see now one language that's crossing application spaces and, be, and destroying, taking away talent from those other spaces across many spaces. And that goes back to that picture of you learn Python and you keep going, right? You don't learn a new string function set, but you have a career that evolves and grows and does a ton of fun things that are completely different for your whole career. This is the uh, historical one, right? So Python sort of starts low. You know, and th these are just some of the other ones, right? This is a historical. So this is a, a fun thing to look at and then try to, uh, try to understand. Python's not number one yet. And we, of course, are Java. I was talking to Ian this morning. We started out, the many of us, in, 19, in 2001, maybe 2002, in JA-SIG. I was talking to Ian that JA-SIG and Aperio are surprisingly connected because of the t-shirt that you're wearing. The reason we're in this room is not to build a better learning management system than Canvas, even though that's a fun hobby to have. Um, the reason we're in the room is we're academics, and we want to do something that's not just been handed to us. And we need to band together. And that was no different in 2001 than it is today in 2019. We are academics who don't want to accept the status quo and want to take matters into our own hands. And we use open source. Open source is not the end. It's the means to the end. The end is us being together and saying, what are you doing at your university? And open source is the way that we can get the stuff out of our universities and pass the tech transfer at the university and into other universities. So open source is not why we're here. We're here because of the people. And that's what I want to promote as I go around the world talking to people about Aperio outside of our community is this is the place that university tech people who are not satisfied with the status quo should come. Uh, how much time I got? Okay, so one of the things that I'm doing in this talk is I'm making a statement as if I believe it to be true and I sort of mostly believe it to be true, but I want to challenge you to disagree with me. Um, and so sometimes I'll say, what questions? And then people throw their hands up and they start asking me questions. And I'll just, some of the times I've given this before, the common question is, what about JavaScript, right? There's a bunch of JavaScript people. And um, I want to show you a little tiny video that I use when I start teaching JavaScript. I've taught JavaScript to a bunch of people. And I'm going to show you a little tiny video from a, a fellow named uh, uh, Gary Bernard. And he is a, a thinker. He's like a fun keynote speaker about like the future of stuff, right? So he mostly sees the world through humor. And, um, and so this is a lightning talk he gave. I'm going to start in the middle called What? And um, he's just talking about like the funkiness of JavaScript. And then I'll talk about the actual serious part about it. So let me get this up. If you ever actually do this, then what? <laughs> Let's talk about JavaScript. <laughs> Does anyone know in JavaScript what array plus array is? Well, let me ask you this first. What should array plus array be? Empty array. Empty array. I would also accept type error. Uh, that is not what array plus array is. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. Array plus array is empty string. <laughs> Obviously. I think, that's, I think that's obvious to everyone. Uh, now, what, what would array plus object be? This should obviously be type error, because those are completely disparate types. Uh, does anyone know what this is? Uh, no. Close. No. Far away. It's object. <laughs> right, right. Nicely done. Now, of course, because uh, this is plus, so you can flip the operands and the same thing comes out. So if we do, what? Is 
No, that's just an object. Uh, if you do object plus array, you should get exactly the same thing, which, as you can see, you do. <laughs> and finally, uh, the only one of these that's actually true is, uh, because, you know, you add arrays, you get empty string, that doesn't make sense. But an object plus an object is actually not a number, technically. <laughs> so this one's actually right. And uh, exactly, right? Like, what is even going on in this lab? I just, I don't even understand <laughs> what person with a brain in their head would think that any of this is a good idea. <laughs> okay, okay. Enough making fun of languages that suck. Let's talk about JavaScript. <laughs> if I say array.new16, uh, or just array16, I get an array of 16 things, which it represents as 16 commas, which is obvious. And uh, if I then join those with a string, then I get the string 16 times. This is actually the only line in this entire presentation that's reasonable. Uh, now, if I take that string and then add a 1 to it, it interprets uh, the 1 as, or, or casts the 1 to a string, and then we get wat 1 a bunch of times. Fine. Does anyone know what will happen if I subtract 1 from the string? <laughs> I'm assuming no one does. Let me, I'll give you a hint. Does, does this help? Does anyone know? Yes. <laughs> Wet man. That's all I got. Thank you, guys. So I... I am just showing you that as an ad to watch this other talk that I reference here, and that's his, his Birth and Death of JavaScript, which is actually a 35-minute serious talk. In what, what, what he's really telling you is that the core fundamental consistency of a language actually kind of matters, and there's a lot of sloppiness in JavaScript. But I encourage you to watch the Birth and Death of JavaScript. And the short version of the Birth and Death of JavaScript is that JavaScript is not the general purpose language of the future. JavaScript is actually the machine language of the future. It is the operating system of the future, right? And if you know a thing called ASM.js, there is a way to write code that JavaScript is the machine language, meaning that ASM.js is the weirdest, and he talks about this in here, it's the weirdest variation of JavaScript that you could ever imagine, but it's been carefully constructed to run at machine, sp machine code speed. And so what he talks about is how you could imagine in multi-threaded and multi-processing environments that we don't even use Linux anymore. What we use is we use a, JVM, a, a JavaScript virtual machine that has the threading and it has the isolation and the context switching is really cheap and we all write in whatever language you want and then it compiles to JavaScript and it runs really scorchingly fast. Now, I'm not saying that that's the answer, but I, 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 I can't see how JavaScript takes over as the general purpose scripting language because JavaScript, for one thing, can't be extended by libraries that are native in the same way. Although, we'll see. We'll see. JavaScript is the... And so the other one that, that sort of... I couldn't... I couldn't... I, someone said, what about Julia? And everyone says, what about Scala? And I say, Scala sucks. It's just, it's just JavaScript done over. It looks easy because there's not as much crap in it, but is, in, if Scala lasts long enough, it'll be just as crufty as Java. What about Elixir? What about, you know, whatever, whatever. Then I, I can dismiss those pretty easy because they're point oh 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 one percent and they got like 30 years to catch up and they'll be dead like in three years. So it just doesn't matter. They're never going to reach. But this Julia one, like, I, I couldn't get it out of my head. And so Julia wants to be a combination of C and Python. And uh, it talks about integrating libraries. And Julia is kind of coming up there. So, so you look at a language that truly makes life better better in terms of performance and ease of use. And something like Julia is the, is the kind of the dark horse in my mind that, that might sort of sneak up. But I think at some point, if Julia does anything good, Python will just steal it and put it in as a C library. And then it'll be a library called Import Julia. And that's a way that, that uh, Python tends to destroy these poor little things before they have a chance to, to grow. Now, I got a couple things that are kind of like crazy Python stuff, not because I'm telling you this because I think this is the, the future, but it gives you a sense of holy crap. So the first thing that 
I saw at PyCon was a thing called Anvil. And I happen to know about these people because they use the same JavaScript compiler, JavaScript Python compiler that I do. And then all of a sudden, I saw these commits going way up because this whole thing's open source. And these Anvil people. So what Anvil people do is they, they in effect, create web applications that are like Visual Basic. And it creates the front end and the back end. And it compiles all this Python stuff into JavaScript. And the front end part is Python compiled to JavaScript that really is kind of like Visual Basic or Real Basic, where it's all these little widgets and it's all tied together. Now, of course, that's, you know, there's performance issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's like, you know, drag and drop programming. I liked Visual Basic. I mean, it's one of my top five programming languages, the Visual Basic 4 at least, because you can edit Visual Basic 4 using VI. Um, but I, did, I do like Visual Basic, and I do like drag and drop programming, especially because you can draw prettier things that way. Um, but this is even crazier. This is a thing called Brython. And Brython's goal is to eliminate JavaScript from the browser. So what it does is it compiles literally all of Python into ASM.js. And if you watch, this loads about 70 little JS files. And then what you do is you say script text Python from browser import document, and then you just write Python. I was at a, like a hack fest trying to use this. And, and I would like try to type a line, and my brain just couldn't even type the line. Because this is in the background of an HTML document, and it's a script tag, and it's Python. And I'm like, I'm just afraid that I'll sort of cause the world to sort of collapse into a one black hole by typing the wrong thing. I'm like, what is this? But literally, you can write with zero JavaScript on the page. And it seems to work pretty good. I've not tried it because I'm just afraid that I'll cross the streams. And I think you weren't supposed to cross the streams. At least last I was told, you're not supposed to cross the streams. But this is the kind of nutty Python stuff that Python is such a big and diverse community, right? So now I'm going to tell you what I think are the flaws in the presentation that I just gave you to help you ask me some questions and make some challenges. So this picture of the programmer starting a computer science degree to, to a couple years ago, the ugliness in this, the thing that makes it so I can't make it like, look how pretty it is, is frickin' desktop applications and mobile applications. These desktop mobile applications. And if you look at my career, a lot of the crappy stuff that I did in my career that was short-lived was all because all of a sudden I want to do something on the desktop. And it's hard. It's just hard on the desktop because you've got to use the vendor proprietary stuff. And then you're kind of just chasing the vendor proprietary stuff and rewriting your crap all the time. Like Java wanted to do it. No. But you know, now this poor person has to learn Swift and Java and VB.net just so they can write some stupid desktop applications. So I don't know how that gets fixed. And Python has historically not done a, at all a good job of desktop applications. And so that's a space that, that I would not, I think, it's, it's almost as likely that Python will replace JavaScript, perhaps even more likely Python will replace JavaScript than Python will become a dominant desktop development environment, which makes me sad because I don't think it's hard. All these people like this. Anvil, if they would just make a desktop environment, I'm like, that would be so much more valuable than you making a web page that I can't optimize. But OK. Here's another thing. Um, the biggest weakness at this point that Python has as a programming language, and the, and the one remaining strength that languages like Java have is, is strong typing. I literally would be terrified to write a million lines, 1.5 million lines of code in Python. We could never release the product. I mean, the day you wrote, write, write a 1.5 million lines of code, it'll never work. I mean, you, if you took something the size of Sakai. Now, the good news is that um, if you were to write Sakai in Python, it wouldn't be 1.5 million lines of code, because you don't have to make so many things. And, and so you, OK, you make uh, 250,000 lines of code, which is still a lot of code, right? Because the Python is denser, it's more efficient, it's easier to express an idea in Python and Java. But I'll just, I'll just point this out. This is, and this, to me, is the, this is the beginning of the end of the Java programming language. I, actually, Oracle is the beginning of the end of the Java programming language. Um, uh, Gita Van Rossum, the creator of Python, stepped down as the benevolent dictator for life uh, recently. Uh, and, uh, but he hasn't left Python. What he has done is he's moved from the, being the chief do of all of it, the language itself, and moving into just building one library. So Guido Van Rossum, in his spare time, is building the library that's going to add static type checking to Python. 
So that tells me something about how important he thinks adding static type checking to Python is. So if you have the ease of use and then the, and this is done in a sort of a separate process where it kind of goes over the Python, you kind of annotate your Python with static checking, and then it'll look at our 250,000 lines of code and check to see if the third parameter was changed from a string to a dictionary by mistake. And there's a place, we use that method 450 places in the code, and we didn't catch them all, and so it's not even going to compile at that point. And that's what we do in Sakai, right? We change a method signature, and then we find instantly all the places that we broke within like 10 seconds, and then we go fix them. And this is coming to Python, uh, and I think that for Python truly to sort of get above C++ and Java, uh, this kind of thing is essential to Python. So that's currently a weakness of Python. Um, so to sort of sum up and wrap up, here we are at an Imperio conference, and other than being interesting and funny, why is this relevant in the Imperio conference? And we have folks that do Java in this building, and that's because when we started out in 2003, we started this project, and it came out of a university, and there was a bunch of smart Java people at universities. And so these smart Java people built stuff at these universities, and like, hey, let's share this with each other. And then I would fly around and I would go walk into a room in Cambridge and I would say, I'm starting this open source project. And the people in the room were all super senior 40-year-old Java developers with 10 years of Java experience who were underutilized. And then I'm saying, come join the circus. And they're like, yeah, we'll join the circus. And so that was the rapid growth of Sakai. And to some degree, uPortal was there's this, these geniuses at universities that were spare resources that were like idling and bored at universities, but they were super senior developers. And for a decade, we gave them something to do that was wonderful, right? And what we find is they all end up working for Longsight. They don't work at their university anymore. Why? Because the university just decides, Java programmers annoy us. They're kind of expensive, and they want to travel. And so we'll just hire non-Java programmers and not have any programmers at all. And so what happens is today, if you were to start a Java pro project, you would, and you started looking for volunteers for a Java project like Sakai, you would literally find zero people under 35 that would even go, Java, huh? Unless they were forced to learn it in high school to get the AP Computer Science, which they re re forgot one second after they finished that class. But you're not going to find the talent that we found in Sakai just by wandering around the world and going to all these wonderful universities and finding three to five super talented Java developers who are bored and like travel, right? So I think from an Aperio uh, perspective, if we want the average age of this group to get any smaller, we've got to stop doing everything in Java. We're not the JA SIG anymore. And so I'm doing my part. I'm taking my Sugi thing, which is PHP. Nobody seems to like PHP very much. So I'm going to redo it in Python over the next year. And part of it is so that I can go places and try to expose all these ideas to young people and have them go like, I love open source. My job's boring. I wish I could do something cool on the weekend. I'm like, yeah, there's fun travel and karaoke, and it's really a blast, and you'll meet people and a career growth, et cetera. And I'm like, and you got to learn Java. And I go, oh, uh, yeah, man, I, I got, let, me, let me get my PlayStation back going again, right? No one, no one will go away from their PlayStation long enough to learn Java, unless, of course, they're making a quarter of a million dollars a year. Then any age and every age will learn Java. So I think that we need not all of our projects, and, and we're not going to change Sakai to Python, at least not for five years or so. Um, did I say it out loud? <laughs> I do spend time thinking about what we'll call it. Right now I call it the, the last LMS. But OK, that's, that's, not, that's neither here nor there. I do think that for this organization to succeed, we need things in Python. I think it's that simple. If we, we have the kind of values and the kind of people and the kind of community that young people want to be part of and they enjoy being part of this, but they're not coming if all we say is learn Java before you show up, right? So I think that's important to us. And I'm going to do my part. I'm going to do my part. So I'll close with this. I just, you know, this is just a tweet. Insane Python speed up from number JIT, J, JIT stands for just in time something or other, doing 27,000 simulations, each of which was eight numerical integrations using the quad. I added a decorator to my target function and sped it up 25 times, elapsed time 18.5 minutes without number 7.7 .7 hours. And I don't even know what they're talking about here. 
All I know is some crazy bunch of people made a library in Python and made something go super fast without making someone learn a new programming language. And so this is where, like, learning Julia, I just don't see it, right? I don't see that Julia is going to win. I mean, you just write a gadget that's in C, and you make it a decorator on a function, and it, everything goes fast, right? And so without forcing people to throw away the code that they've actually tested and know what works, you just, like, drop a library in, and things go 25 times faster. I mean, it's amazing. And so that's the danger of Python. That's why it's a real dangerous activity to bet against Python. Thank you for your time.